and we've got a really busy session today. Um, we're going to be focusing um, on seeds and seed sourcing and some information and this is quite heavy in terms of content um, but I think both Jill and I are in consensus that it's really useful important background information and will keep you keep you right if you just got like get a few of the components in um, and then we've got other things to cover if we can we're gonna um, we'll do a bit of chat but we'll also try and do some recommendations and links at the end um, and possibly if we've got time talk about um, pests and diseases and possibly um, organic feeds but we're just going to see how we get on I think our absolute limiting factor is sort of one o'clock or five to one so yeah well, that'll give us over we'll be over already what we've agreed so do feel free to, to, to go out at quarter two if you want to I'm going to stop I'm going to pass the the mantle to Jill can you screen uh yeah can you give me the power to screen share I think I have oh have you oh. <laughs> probably just in the last two seconds so. oh sorry if I just muted someone that was trying to talk sorry okay is that coming up can you see that Yes, I can see that. Perfect. Okay. Cool. Let's go. Right. There's a lot, a lot to rattle through in here. Um, I've had a second cup of coffee, so we should be fine. So seeds and sourcing then, some points to consider. Now I'm just going to um, really just rattle through this. Um, so introducing you all to, to seed quality itself, consider... Our seed production is very subject to vagaries of climate, so we know that seeds are grown all over the world. We must accept that harvests um, can be good and both poor, and that there are years where that will definitely reflect in seed quality. We're all aware of um, farmers talking about how the seed potatoes were bad this year because of blight or whatever. And we have to cooperate as well with the standards um, of purity and germination. Now, these are actually laid down in law. And the reason for that being so that when you go out and buy seed, um, you get seed which is of good quality. Um, and that comes in under um, EU legislation. Now, I don't, I'm not getting political here. Um, I'm not going to say any more about it other than I suspect this may not have changed. I don't see there's any advantage to it having been changed. So as far as I'm still aware, um, seeds can only be sold throughout the EU if they are listed in the common catalogue and in each of the indiv individual member countries they also have an appropriate national list and they must be in there if they want to be up for sale um, within the EU and within Britain and as far as I know that has not changed. Um, as a direct result then of modern economics if we look at the effect that that has on seed quality and um, the costs that were involved in it um, to produce seeds and things and get them out to people has invariably meant that old heritage varieties have become withdrawn because they're not as economical as these newer seed types. And really the, uh, via the sort of heritage seed libraries, which is why we've seen a bit of a demise um, in our, our older heritage breeds. Happier to say that that's um, now on the turn again. So. When you go into the likes of supermarkets and garden centres, very often what you'll find are the most popular seed types and varieties on sale because they're the ones basically that, that net them more money, more profit at the end of the day. You will get a wider choice available to you um, online and mail order, um, but that's where you'll probably find most of your... Um, bigger varieties, the ones that you get in garden centres and supermarkets, they tend to be the same ones all the time. Moving very swiftly on then, let's have a quick look at seed germination and viability. Okay, so two uh, little phrases for you there. What is seed germination? Very simply, the emergence of the young root through the seed coats. Remember the wee picture I showed you with the seed in its little coat? Um, and that root, the radical, breaks through the seed coat Usually at the micropile, that was that tiny little hole that let all the water in. And at that point, that's when we say that the seed has germinated. What is seed viability? A viable seed has the potential for germination. It doesn't actually necessarily mean it's going to germinate because the correct external conditions must be there for that process to happen. And water, of course, to allow it to fill out. 
So those are the differences between the two. So a viable seed is one that should, given the correct conditions, then germinate. So all seed deteriorates with age. It gradually will lose viability over time, but it is most rapid under damp and hot conditions. So always try and store your seeds in a dry, cool place, rodent proof if you've got issues with rodents, and please make sure that things are correctly labelled, okay? Sometimes if you're buying electrical goods, you will find these little silica gel packets which are in the base to help um, keep things dry while they're in sitting on a shelf in a shop, basically. And these are brilliant to actually pop in your seed boxes as well because they'll do the same thing um, for your seeds. The ability of the seed to germinate depends hugely on you storing it correctly. Now, there are different types of seed. In the main, there are two types of seed. We've got orthodox. And all that means is these um, are very, very common. Dried, they can be cooled, and this slows down the aging process. And in some cases, they can be kept viable for hundreds of years. And we got shown one um, by the lecturer at the Royal Botanic Gardens, and he was telling us about a Judean date palm. And this seed had been accidentally stored and what they did was they took it out of storage. Um, when they found it, they took it out of storage, put it in some soil, added some water, and it germinated. And this seed had been dated back to 2,000 years ago. So they managed to get a Judean date palm to germinate after 2,000 years. That is a classic example of an orthodox seed. So ideally, um, store in cool, dry conditions. Try not to leave them in warm kitchens or on window ledges or in a damp shed. Ideally above, um, sorry, below freezing. For every plus five degrees Celsius rise in temperature, your storage life of your seeds can be halved. So definitely not storing them in a warm room. Use a rodent proof airtight jar or a tin or something sealable. And examples of orthodox seed include things like broad beans, broccolis, carrots, flowers like nigella, love in the mist, okay? So lots and lots of orthodox seed. The other example then, the other type you get are known as unorthodox or recalcitrant seed. And these do not tolerate drying or freezing in any way, and they need cool, moist conditions to survive. They will not survive for long periods of time. I think you'd be extremely lucky to see one past four or six months. Okay, so these don't last a long time at all. Um, and examples of these would include oak, horse chestnut, willow elm, avocado, mango, rubber, and cocoa. Okay, so just to give you a very quick insight into the types of seeds that are available. There's a little table coming up then. Um, we've got tomatoes and legumes then for viability, expected viability then for those particular types of seeds up to about 10 years. Brassica, lettuce, undive, chicory, about four or five years, but more often than not, they'll fall off after two. Onions and leeks deteriorate very quickly after sort of two years and roots, um, vegetables, some of your root vegetables, parsnips and sweet corn, very rapid and you're best to replace them every year. Okay, I hope that's all making sense. I know I'm rattling through it. Um, we've got... Oh. A lot of echo there all of a sudden, is that okay? Um, how to test then for viability, um, use a small dish, fill it with a piece of foam rubber or a bit of sponge, wet it, cover it with a double layer of paper toweling, lay some seed on top of the paper and then place it somewhere warm, at least 21 degrees Celsius. Cover it with a plastic bag and if there's no germination within two weeks, cut your losses and replace your seed with fresh stuff because it's not going to germinate. So that saves you using up compost and things and then discovering in a couple of weeks time that you've not got any seed. Um, seed types and sourcing then, they come in various different shapes, sizes and forms. Just very quickly again, I'm going to rattle through. We have foil packs, seed remains viable until the foil packs are opened. And that's a normal way that we tend to see our seeds. Once you've opened them, normal deterioration rates will then occur. We have naked, what's called naked, which is just ordinary individual seeds. We have pelleted, which have been covered with a protective material, and that's usually to make them easier to handle if you've got really small or really awkward seeds to handle or really fragile seeds to handle. 
Pellets are another type. Um, these are usually um, just another type of pellet, and these are usually used by commercial seed growers. So you'll hear them talk about seed pills. Seed tapes, these are relatively new on the market, are absolutely brilliant for beginners. These are seeds which have been spaced in a material. It's a soluble material. All you have to do is place it down on top of your seed bed, give it a water, cover it up, and then the seeds will pop through. A great example of this is carrot and they're brilliant. Um, it reduces the need completely to start thinning out your carrots. You have chitted and pre-germinated. You hear of potatoes being chitted, and um, that just means that you're pre-germinating them before you put them in the ground. So the seed has just been taken to the point of germination and is then sent out. And again, these are quite great, um, of great value, sorry, for beginners. A good example here would be cucumber seeds. Cucumber needs a higher temperature to germinate. Once you've got it germinated, then you can then reduce it down to about 15, 10 to 15 degrees. But it does need to be a bit higher to get it to germinate. So buy them pre-germinated and then you just have to water them and away they go again. Primed, the seed is at the point of germination. So not quite it's then peeled and sent out. And again, that tends to be much more commercial based. And we have dressed or treated seeds. These are seeds that have been dusted with chemicals, usually to deter some sort of soil borne diseases. And they are most definitely not organic. OK, so if you want to be growing organically, you don't want anything that's been dressed or treated. Again, it tends to be larger agricultural practice where they'll use that if they've got farmers growing things where there's a huge problem um, with soil borne diseases. OK, so but they are most definitely not organic. Variety of seed then is huge. The amounts that you can get is huge and it can be quite bewildering. Um, however, there are indicators of quality and suitability. So before we go any further, <laughs> I can see Sharon smiling. Um, now then, this is very much um, what I'm about to try and do is to, to rattle through um, possibly nearly 150, 170 years worth of um, knowledge on plant don't, genetics here in about rattle. four slides. Catch, catch your breath, you're really <laughs> hardcore, you're doing amazing. <laughs> right. Jill's mindful of how much information we're going to give, but do just, you're doing amazing. Yes, I am. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there is a slight disclaimer to this before I start as well. Number one, I am not a botanist. I am also not a geneticist. Um, however, I do have a little bit of knowledge having taught a basic introduction to genetics module, but that was on animals, not on plants. So this is my understanding of it, but it is something that um, Sharon and I feel a little bit strongly about. And we feel it's worthwhile just pointing some of these things out to you to make you aware as well. And that's all I would like to say on it. So at the end of the day, it's your garden and you do what you want with it. But um, this is our kind of recommendation, okay? I'm going to hopefully try and start with a little video and we'll see what happens this week. You're silent. <laughs> is it silent? You're just going... Rah, 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 rah. Oh, <laughs> right, do you know what? Forget That's it. All right. We're not going to waste time with it. Move on. Take your time. Okay. You're doing well for time. Take your time. Okay? Right. Okay. All I wanted to explain in that, because there's a few terms coming up, the first one is do we mean by open pollinated? Very much think Mother Nature. Any plant that's described as being open pollinated can be pollinated by the wind, can be pollinated by an insect, or no, no, we could help no, it no, along no, no, with stop, some paintbrushes. You're too fast even for me, dude. Oh. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Just catch your breath. <laughs> Sorry, I don't know if anyone else. Catch your breath, it's all right. <laughs> Go slow. Okay, so some terms coming up. Open pollinated. Um, think of open pollinated as being um, the way that Mother Nature does it. That is a plant that um, pollinates either with the use of the wind or either with the use of an insect coming, like a bee coming along, or you can open pollinate plants yourself using a paintbrush, for example, you could transfer pollen from one plant to another. But that is kind of a normal way that plants would pollinate. It's the way Mother Nature designed it. That's what I want you to think about there, okay? If we think about um, a cultivar, 
and the clue is in the word there, cultivar stands for a cultivated variety. They tend to come from normal plants that have been out in the wild. So if we take a poppy, for example, we could um, pollinate poppies together. We could make a new cultivar, a new cultivated variety. So we have done the pollination process and then we give it a fancy name like pom-pom. So you have poppy pom-pom, that becomes a cultivar and they are plants which we have deliberately created but there is variety and they come from a wild-based plant, okay? We then have um, what's called hybrids, F1s, F2s, and even F3 hybrids. F1 hybrids are also cultivated by us, but there is a word of caution with these things because F1 hybrids, F2 hybrids, F3 hybrids have been deliberately inbred. Now, what I want you to think about here is any of you have got dogs at home, and I am going to refer to dogs because that's what I know. If you have dogs at home, if you just think about how the wolf has kind of evolved into the dog in our living room today, we deliberately picked traits from back years ago because we wanted a dog to hunt or we wanted a dog to guard or we wanted a dog to scent. So we deliberately picked these animals that were good at smelling, that were good at guarding and chasing off somebody from across the glen, or that were good at pointing out prey for us. And we bred from them deliberately. And you come full circle 15,000 years later. And sadly, what they've done with a lot of dog breeds is they've inbred. They've deliberately inbred because they wanted to fix the trait that they wanted. That doubles up on the things you want but it also doubles up on the things you don't want. And it's the best example I can give you because now, of course, we have animals with hip dysplasia. We have problems with dogs where eyelids are turning in the way or out the way. We have all sorts of eye disorders. There's an awful lot of problems being caused by this. So that's the thing to keep in your mind that yes, you can fix something that you want, but you can also fix something that you don't want. And that is the downside to some of these hybrid types. So compared with the open pollinated varieties, the ones that you would find being naturally pollinated in the wild by mother nature, the hybrid plants, what's good about them, they have exceptional vigor. They're usually strong. They are usually well grown. They usually give you a certain amount of quality. There is uniformity there. In other words, you can get the same thing again and again. And there is resistance to pest and disease. And that's initially why they were brought in, because there were problems with pest and disease. And that's a good thing, right? That means that somebody could grow something in their ground where they know that they've got a disease and whatever they're growing is resistant to it now because of that seed. The downside to that seed, though, is it is expensive. The other downside to it is that that cross, that botanist or whoever it is it takes one plant and another plant and crosses it together that has to be remade every single year because if you take seed from these f1 hybrid varieties and you try and save that seed and then grow that seed some of them will grow but they will not breed true and what we mean by that is you would see differences coming up you would see them reverting back to something that's in so they do not breed true and what you can sometimes get is something that looks nothing like the original plant that you bought so they are widely used in commercial horticulture partly because they create these new varieties and they can patent them and when they patent them that just means they can make more money out of them and this has been a major factor in the demise of our heritage seed varieties OK, so here's a nice wee example here. This is lovely. You get black petunias. They're gorgeous. But black petunias have probably taken in the region of 50, 60 years to get them to develop. It's been a very careful and controlled process of deliberate cross pollination of genetically inbred plants. That's what they're doing. They're inbreeding and inbreeding and inbreeding the whole time. And you achieve this hybrid 
which in this example is lovely. So this black hybrid will have blue petunias in it somewhere, it'll have dark red petunias in it, and it'll have yellow petunias in it. And it's a lovely little thing. But moving on, if you try and save the seed from that first plant, it will not breed true. This is what I've said. Now, if you look at that picture that we have an the example there, you can see that one of the flower leaves there is lovely. It's still quite blackish in colour, but you can also see now that there's yellow streaking through it. And you can also see the hints of magenta and some of the background ones as well. These are the plants that have been used in bred into its history in order to create it. So it's still ex a pretty example. It's still lovely. But as we said, as well as doubling up some of the features that you do like, think back to our first petunia, that lovely, true, rich black tone in the first example, you can also double up any genetic faults as well. And that's not a good thing. If you then breed from that generation again, you get what's called the F2 pri hybrid. This is second filial generation. You get first filial, second filial, third filial. You don't need to remember that, but you might just come across it. That's why we're telling you. So these are two controlled crosses from four select lines. So they take their plant and it has a mother and father plant. They take their second plant and it has a mother and father plant. That's where the four selected lines are coming from. Those two plants are then bred is an F2 hybrid, and that is from self or cross fertilization of the F1s. Some of these plants, again, will still retain some of those original characteristics that you like, like the vigor or the disease resistance of the parent. But other characteristics like the uniformity, think back to the ones with the yellow streaks on it, and some other less desirable features will have already crept in. Okay. If you look at this picture then, this is some of the downsides to that type of inbreeding. So just the same as we would in us see problems with inbreeding and problems in our animals, you can still also see that in plants. It is still true in plants. Look at the leaves on this one. You can see that there's mottling effects on the leaves there. There's discoloration on the leaves. There's deformity in the leaves. And then look at the actual flowers themselves. There are deformities in the flowers in the shapes and the sizes. So that's the thing to remember. The man that kind of started all of this off is a chap called um, Gregor Johann Mendel with a little bit of input from Charles, Charles Darwin, of course, as well. But he um, started to look into the genetics and he started actually with pea plants and he did uh, an experiment in 1856 with pea plants to determine hereditary and it became known as what's known as Mendelian inheritance to say that the genes are passed on. Okay, so that is just a very quick rattle through. Um, but the problem with these types of seeds are genetically modified. There are too many unanswered questions. It's not been researched hard enough in my own opinion and I'm sure Sharon would agree with me here as well. There don't seem to be enough um, long-term answers. These types of experiments, I guess, have not been running long enough to discover what the long-term effects of this type of plant breeding technique would give us. Yeah. Okay, so we quite strongly feel yeah. that um, as gardeners... Lay down. Um, we okay, lay down. Oh, I'm sorry. Lay down. Somebody's seen oh, to a dog. <laughs> yeah, lay down. <laughs> so lay down. <laughs> that was a lot cleaner than I am with my dog. Uh, Jill, there's a very quick question um, yeah. about second generation hybrids. If they pose a problem for leaking out into the general garden, I just thought maybe if they start self-seeding all over the place. Um, but have you got any thoughts on that? Um, they, they can still produce seed, yeah. They can still produce seed. And this is a problem is that they don't know enough about um, what they've done with the breeding in the past to get some of these plants like, okay, they know where they've come from in the past, but what we don't know is the effect that they're going to have in the future in 60 or 70 or 80 years' time. That would, so that's my understanding of it. And as I said at the start, I'm not a geneticist or a botanist in any sense of the word. So um, this is very much my take on it. But that's what I feel is the downside to it is we don't know enough about how it's going to affect things in the future. So we know that we've already got invasive plants within the UK 
We already know that we've got invasive species within the UK. We only need to think about New Zealand flatworm there for a good example of that. So how, you know, how do they know how this is going to affect things in the future? That's, for me, that's the worry. And, and in particular, given that we can see what that inbreeding process has done to our dogs. And I know that plants are different. As I said, I'm not a botanist. I know that plants can cope with things better in some respects than we can. But it's just that question about what happens in the future. How can they be so sure in the future that it's not going to affect things? So, um, yeah. Seed saving is what, in, in my opinion, <laughs> get on my soapbox, but one of the best things that you can do in Absolutely. terms of food sovereignty and supporting local local food, because you're growing, as you save from seed, you're like producing strains that are more um, adapted to your climate, and particularly Absolutely. in Sutherland, you know, we have beautiful seeds that, and beautiful plants, things like the Sutherland kale, which I think you can only buy from real seeds. I think I said this last week on the last one, but but it Sutherland did. kale, which was came from Alapur, was an adapted strain, and then you can only buy it from someone in England these days, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. that's you know that's what's happened. We've had our power removed from us. So, so but the difference, important. the difference with your kale there, Sharon, is it's a cultivar, so it's yes. not been inbred, it's not hybridized. It's not. It yeah. is not hybridized. Exactly. It is not inbred. So after one generation is produced, another variety would come in and be bred with it, so to speak. So that is a cultivar. That is the biggest difference. Cultivars oh, are not inbred. Yeah. You can save seed from them, absolutely. Yeah. Hybrids are inbred. That, that's so the biggest the difference. The rule of thumb is if you want to save seed, avoid a hybrid. Yes. By all means, use a hybrid, yeah. but know the devil that you're dancing with. Is that yeah. Affair. Yeah. Every now and then, your signal drops out. Okay, just wondering sorry. if I, if I, no, no, don't be sorry. I'm just wondering if we take your video off, if it'll make it a bit clearer. It just drops out for ten seconds or something. But is that okay if we, if yeah, we turn of your video so. off? Right. Yeah. I'll let you carry on then. Right. <laughs> I'll get finished off. There's not much, much no. more. No, it's okay. Not um, so yeah, so what can you use then? Anything that says um, suitable for organic growers, of course. Anything that's got an award of merit. Um, usually that's come from the RHS. What else can you use? Anything that's been classed as certified stock. Now, there are various certification schemes across the UK and in Europe. They are things like Plant Health Agency. They are things like Scottish Seed Potato Certification Schemes. And that means that you are buying stock that is free from disease, first of all. It is vigorous. In other words, it is healthy and it's going to grow and is true to type. So if you buy a variety like the Sutherland kale that um, Sharon was talking about, then what grows is Sutherland kale. It is true to type and you're not being fleeced um, by a plant breeder, if, if you'll pardon the expression, not that it's in their interest to do that. Um, but um, it particularly more so for things like fruit. If you're buying fruit trees, then you'll find that most of these things come from certified stock. And that's why um, so some of our sources, some of the sources that Sharon and I use, and um, we've already mentioned real seeds there, and the website pages are there for you if you haven't heard of them. Plants of Distinction, I mentioned this last week in the group because I, I thought they were Glasgow based, but apparently I think they're down in Cheshire. So um, I must correct myself on that one. Um, I thought they were Scottish based, but Plants of Distinction, um, I've had some stuff from them and they're good stuff that comes through. We have Scotia seeds, we have Tamar Organics, um, there's the Royal Horticultural Society as well. They can be a little bit pricey, but again, you know that you're getting good quality plants. And then the other one is Heritage Seeds, and I think I'm also aware that Heritage Seeds have also been taken over by Real Seeds. Somebody was saying that in the chat last week. Again, don't quote me on that, not entirely. Um, sure on that one but these are the ones that Sharon and I have used in the past as well so so just a very quick summary then is organic gardeners then if you think about what we've spoken about over the last few weeks um, we want you to try to view your activities as an integrated whole and try to establish a sustainable way forward look at the whole picture look at what you're wanting to grow look at what you've got in your garden look at ways of improving the biodiversity within your garden 
and accept that you are going to get a little bit of damage from pests and things. It's just put aside a little bit and know that you're just going to lose a little bit. Conserve your non-renewable resources. So um, be very, very mindful of watering. Be very mindful of things like composts. Um, let's try not to use peat-based compost. We really, really should be avoiding these now like the plague. Um, and do your own garden compost. Compost, compost, compost. Use what you've got in your own garden. It's the best way to stop new diseases coming into your own gardens is to use the garden compost from your garden. Eliminate reliance on external inputs. And we will need to buy stuff in from time to time but try to rely more on what you've got in your own garden and create things from your own garden. Maintain your soil fertility and build biodiversity within your garden. Avoid the use of things like quick release fertilizers and pesticides and try as much as possible to manage your pests and diseases organically. Using that biodiversity, there is a huge amount of um, predator items out there, your ladybirds, your parasitic wasps, all sorts of things that will keep um, pests under control. Encourage them in. Think about the planting and the flowering that you can put in to bring them in and help you do that. There are, of course, resistant cultivars. And remember, we said cultivars are okay to use. And they will help you if you have a disease like um, club root, of course, and cabbages, for example. You will get cultivars that are club root resistant because it stays in your soil for up to 20 years. So crop rotation would be difficult there because it would still be there. So use the cultivars where you need them, yeah? Think about things like physical barriers, pesticides that are derived from plant extracts. So garlic sprays, for example, and also citrax is a natural occurring disinfectant that you can buy if you want to wash your pots and things. There are crop rotation of your plant species as well that will help with that too. And as we've said, naturally occurring predators and parasites in your garden. Okay, so whistle stop tour. Um, just to show you very quickly, this was my garden when I moved in. I did nothing to it for a year. I waited to see what came up. There wasn't very much. And uh, I think this was in 2018, this picture was taken. Um, just to show you the difference. So my polytunnel's in, there's a peony getting a bit of protection from the wind here. Um, but just adding more stuff in and just trying to, desperately trying to get a bit more biodiversity into the garden and cope with the mountains of ground elder and vine weevils. So um, my garden is continuing. It is a work in progress, aren't they all? So that's all I've got to say on that. I hope that's been um, useful. Oh, that's been useful. Shall I start my video again? Mm. Here we go. Thanks, Jill. Do you want to take the screen back? Oh, yeah. Go on, I'll do that. <sighs> Stop. No idea. You from Stop sharing. sharing. <laughs> <There it is. laughs> you have control. <laughs> I just, I would do a, a massive clap for Jill myself because that's a huge <sighs> subject. And there's some really core cool things and we're both very mindful of like, you know, if you're at the beginning of the chair, there's a lot to take on. But thanks everyone also for paying attention. Thanks, Jill. That was a really good job. Um, so I'm going to just try to do a little bit of dipping and diving and share a few more points of useful information with you all. If that's OK, we're going to start with um, something. So our group that we have um, over in... Um, where do we live, Thurso? We've been running this course parallel, but we've actually had an extra session in Thurso, um, which is five weeks as opposed to four. So the last session that we finished this morning was um, covering some topics that the, the people brought up and some questions that people had last week. So this is a, a resource that um, we have forwarded already today, Rebecca, to you and to your team over there. But um, it's an online resource. It's a brilliant booklet. I used to work at this community garden and. Sorry, Joe, you're hearing this twice today, but Sue was a lady who supported the community garden who was in her mid seventies. She is one of the most prolific growers I've ever known, the most amazing garden, the most amazing produce. And she has put together notes over years of gardening and growing in Perthshire, which is a fairly similar climate, if not slightly more difficult than what we have, at least in KSS. And she's put this little booklet together 
And it's a great resource if you're starting out because it gives you jobs and watch so each month of the year. And I'm gonna ask the Leg Learning Centre to share this with everyone here um, because it's just, you know, in April, what will you be saying? Well, in heat, if you've got a heat mat like Jill, very jealous of you, Jill. If not, you can pop it in your polytunnel. If not, you can direct sew outside. So it gives you three different things. And successional sewing, that's a really good one to pay attention to. Do not plant 60 lettuces all together in April. Plant 10 and then plant another 10 <laughs> when, you, when you put those ones out in the ground. So successional sewing. So that's a really good little tip that she's got there. So we'll send that out. Um, there's also beautiful pictures of people in vegetable gardens and um, just gives you jobs around the garden. So we're going to send that out. There's also um, a note we've put on there for an RHS. I've got an app that you can put in. I'm just going to talk through that. So that's a, a recommendation from Jill. If you have a slightly more sort of smart technology, there's an app you can look at, um, which RHS have got. And there's also a website that we've sent forward to your team already, which is garden focused which you can put in where you are and then it will give you planting schedules. Is that right, Jill? Yeah, and also your last predicted frost dates as well, which is quite handy. Gentlemen called the our areas <laughs> where we're currently covered in snow. So I'm just, there's a couple of other slides I want to share with people. And um, just, there we go. We're not gonna go through all of these, but I just wanted to share some common questions that we found come up on the last one some common pests that you might come across as we are starting to grow so just some of these are ones that i found come across um, don't be too too daunted by this um it's just some things to look out for so as an organic gardener, I'd say that the, the philosophy to which we're aiming for is to actually, rather than spend your whole time fighting things, but rather provide the optimum conditions for healthy growth. So try to design and make a system where nature is very abundant and it's also very strong. Um, and also accept that some things will have imperfections, you know, sometimes a caterpillar will through, through, through the outer leaves of your cabbage. And that's fine, the inner leaves are for you, I would suggest always so a little bit more than you think you need. 20% is a good guide because if the odd pigeon comes in and gets 20% of your salad, you've still got an abundance for yourself. Don't over sow too much though. So different insects and, and pests that you might find in your garden, caterpillars. Um, the larva forms of butterflies, they attack, the caterpillars will lay their eggs on your leaves and then the, the larva forms, the caterpillars will hatch and they'll eat their way through your grass. The best thing I can suggest for that is just to keep looking in your garden, keep an eye on these. They can be two different egg laying seasons and then which you were saying earlier. And so yeah, just go out, pick them off, hand pick them off, rub them off your leaves, feed them to your chickens, or Jill said she puts hers on the bird table. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> or pop them in your compost. Um, but yeah, keep an eye um, and, and keep on top of them. They can very quickly decimate something. Um, aphids, so that's the top left-hand corner. You can see these tiny little buggies. They come from things like green fly, black fly, white fly, mealy aphid, and root aphids. There's these tiny little bugs, they pierce your leaves and they drink the sap. And you can see that your attack leaves sort of get twisted and curled or blistered. And what would you, Jill, you were saying that there's also sometimes like a sticky honeydew on them as well, which yes. is an indicator. Yeah, you get like a, um, one of the, the signs that you'll see is it looks like there's like a sugary layer over the top of a leaf. It looks quite shiny and when you touch it, it's sticky. And this is because, um, as Sharon said, these guys are feeding from the sap through a little tube. Uh, their mouth is a little tube and they're taking the sugary phloem, the, the sap from the plant, and it leaves this deposit over the leaves. And then eventually you get black sooty molds and things on it as well. But that's another real quick um, way of telling whether you've got green flies and that or aphids. Any of the aphids do that. And just keep on top of them again by going out in your garden. Watch if you... Try to be a really good observer in your garden. That's my advice. Try to um, keep an eye on your plants. If something's not looking quite right or doesn't feel quite right, then try and have a little investigate 
and with aphids, a garlic spray. So chop up some garlic on the spray bottles, just a couple of cloves in the bottom, leave it in, in the sun for a few hours, and then come along and spray them. <laughs> they don't like that at all. And miss the plant because it makes it unattractive as a, as, a, as a place for them. Pick off leaves that have got lots of them on them and compost them. Um, pick them off. You can get some soapy water with a sponge and just sort of, I don't know, sponge them to death. <laughs> you know, it, it's not nice, but if they get established and if they get strong they can wipe out your young tomato plants they can wipe out your young pepper plants they can be really strong uh, other things like the larval forms of insects so um things like wireworm chaffer bugs leather jackets things like this also beetles and weevils the larvae can you can see in this picture here where there's sort of um and i was saying oh God, it was a sad day last year but i lost about a 12 meter long bed of brassicas I must have had, Jill, I must have had like 50 or 60 plants in. And one day they were all looking absolutely bonny and fine. And then one by one, they started to just fall over. And these lava were like eating through the stem and just the whole thing would sort of, until it was like a point and then just fall over. <laughs> That's the way the world goes around. Um, other things, slugs and snails, be mindful of them. I didn't mention this earlier, but actually <laughs> the big one for us up here is deer. <laughs> I've got some tips on deer. Deer don't like to land where they cannot see. So if your garden is fenced, um, try to keep the areas next to the fence quite busy because they won't like to land if they can't see where they're landing. That's a good way to keep them out. Obviously high fences and geo fences. Um, another good one is urine. If you can send your, 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 yourself or your kids or your man or your dogs out on the boundaries, you can urinate. Um, another good one is peppering. And this is actually quite a good one for lots of animals. <laughs> Never, no one's ever heard of peppering, but. Um, there's no animal really on the planet that will be sort of, um, what's it called when you eat yourself, Jill? When you eat yourself? So, uh, what, sorry? <laughs> I'm not sure what you mean. The peppering. Take a bit of the animal that's the predator, put it in water. So say someone's killed a bit of deer, you've got a bit of a dead deer, yeah? Or a dead oh, deer I see, skin. right, right. You put it in water and you soak it. And then there's that smell, that smell. pusty, nasty smell. And then spray that around your boundaries as well, or around your trees. This apparently works a treat for some animals. So um, Sorry. <laughs> what's it called when you eat yourself? I <laughs> oh, can't mind. Someone help me in the chat. <laughs> uh, slugs and snails, I think I did say before, but they are an indicator quite often of um, weaker plants. That's their job in nature, but there's there's absolutely loads that you can do. To Cannibalism. <laughs> Right, yes, that's amazing. Uh, yeah, keep 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 your dog off your raised bed, Susan. I'll just say that. Yeah, I would. I try and keep everything off my raised bed because it compacts the soil. How do you keep your dog off your raised bed? Well, I just tend to shout. Shouting is a good one. Um, if you want to keep your cats and dogs off your raised bed, when especially when you've got very young plants in it, um, the best thing I've found is to get a big bit of brush. So a, 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 a cut a branch from sort of like a sitka spruce or a pine tree or something that's kind of makes like a and just lay it on top of the bed unless you're starting off your seedlings and they're coming through and they're in that particularly delicate phase that'll hopefully keep your cats and dogs off a little bit and then once they're a bit more established you can whip it off a good shout that's a book i recommend there with the vegetable expert and um, we'll put that out in the email as well we we'll actually already have yeah, i'm ahead of the game today um, Leg Learning Centre, but that's gone to Leg Learning Centre today already. But yeah, that's a great book. It's about four pound fifty or something like that on eBay. Um, got, I think my copy's a bit older than the one there, but it's got a brilliant page. It's just got pictures of some pests and diseases and what they look like and how to combat them. So have a little look if you can. I'd recommend that book highly. It also, is a very simple guide to plants. If this is your first year of growing and you just want a little bit of simple advice of planting distances, when to plant, how to harvest, potentially some varieties, that's a great book. That one, and I'm sure we've mentioned her before, is Joy Larkham. That's the Bible. Mm -hmm. That's, Definitely. you know, that's the tome and that's the coffee break. So, um, lost my page, but one of the last things I was going to say was just in terms of your, your pests um, get to know like also your beneficial insects, just have a think about what is good and helping you in the garden 
So um, there's good examples of sort of ground beetles, um, devil's court host, um, ladybirds, both the adults and the larvae, hoverflies and lacewings, and plant, companion plant to, to invite and make inviting areas in your garden. Hedgehogs, fantastic as well. Um, and when it comes to soil life, if you work on the basis that fast moving creatures tend to be predators, so they tend to be more beneficial for you. So, um, and then things like centipedes, things like that, whereas the slower moving creatures, things like the slugs and snails, they tend to be your pests because they're going slowly and eating on your plants. So um, from our point of view, our pests are our slow movers. Um, wasps, frogs and toads are all very beneficial. Um, possibly less beneficial if you've got an apple orchard and you have a large population of wasps, but otherwise generally they are a friend to your soil. Um, I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm mindful that you're not you're missing these, but that's okay because I've sent you to to this chat, so you're not missing them at all. Uh, but someone asked in the chat earlier about um, easy feeds fertilizers. Just a couple. That I would recommend and I found very helpful and Jill do add in. Jill gets excited about this slide. <laughs> I know Jill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, starting with the eggshells, it's a great calcium feed. You can use it in your garden. It's, I think it's quite a slow release feed but my, my top tip is any time that you eat eggs at home, have a little tray in the bottom of your oven and just throw your eggs in and let it build up and build up. And eventually over the cooking of the, of the cooker being on, don't put it on especially, you'll get lots of eggs. And you can really easily like crumble them and then just store them in a jar in your greenhouse and use it as a calcium feed. Um, I tend to just sprinkle mine on my soil around with tomatoes and things like that. And it's a slow release feed. Um, that top one, that's a liquid manure. So, you can either use well rotted manure, things like um, chicken poo or horse poo, things like that. Um, but you can also actually do something like this with either nettles or comfrey, which are both really good. Um, put it inside something, so that's like a sort of a sacky thing, and, and, and let it sit in water for about 10 days and let that leach into the water and then take that, dilute that until it looks like it's about like your weak tea type dilution and then use it as a feed for your plants. Um, you can even do that with seaweed, which is a brilliant foliar feed. Um, seaweed's got lots of trace elements that we talked about, but also it's got the same amount of organic matter as nitrogen and manure, so you can put seaweed directly on your beds as well. We've talked about that. Comfrey's got nitrogen, phosphate and potash. It's very, very good for your plants. If you do not have a comfrey plant yet, I would recommend that you get one. They're fantastic feeds. You can use them as mulch. Um, and in the summer, you just cut them back two or three times. They're absolutely vigorous. Um, Boinking 14 is the variety I would suggest. Bonking, bonking, B-O. Have a look, Bonking 14. It's the most commonly what sold one in garden places because it doesn't spread too much. Uh, and also, Ash, so if you've got a wood burner, lots of us have, um, potash, hardwoods particularly, but softwoods is fine as well. It's a very soluble feed, so only put it on once you've got your plants in the spring or add it to your compost, but it's a release of potassium, uh, good for fruiting plants like tomatoes or your fruit bushes. Um, another good source of potassium is the banana peels. Can you see in the bottom right hand corner? Um, just put your banana peels in, in water, leave them to soak and then again after sort of 10 days, two weeks, drain off and you've got a feed that you can dilute down and feed with potassium. Oh, the bottom left hand corner is urine. I just think it's amazing stuff uh, and it's not unusual for me to collect my urine. I don't sell, not in plants I sell to people, but at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's a high nitrogen. If you've got a plant that needs a quick fix feed, you know, something like that, collect it in a watering can, water it right down, about 12 parts to one, or whatever, water it down, feed it on your plants. If you've got a plant that's looking a bit sick and might need a nitrogen boost, I would recommend that. Maybe not if you're on heavy drugs. 
I hope that answered Marie's fertilizer question. There's lots of things out there. That top one is a is a similar system to the to the one on the left, but it's like the, it's sort of the side view of the bucket, and you can see there's a handy little tap, and then you can just put things in and sort of weigh it down. But there's there's lots of information online about things, but just to give you guys some ideas, hopefully. Bonky I just had a team. quick question. Um, yeah, go for it. For foolproof way for slugs and snails from Helen, uh, get a frog. <laughs> oh, did we? Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's one of the, as, as uh, Sharon was saying in the presentation, getting things like hedgehogs and that into your garden um, and getting um, birds, you know, really uh, trying to encourage birds and things into your garden as well. Um, it'll help to keep them at bay. Um, beer is a good one. I like, um, I tend to either get a beer can and just the little dregs at the bottom, leave that and then bury the beer can at surface level so that your sort of snail comes along and it's like, oh, great. And it goes in, but it can't actually get out again. So it's a bit, you know, it's a bit, so this is it's a death filled with beer, but it will, it will eliminate um, a lot of plus. Or the other thing that you can do is you can um, get like a cabbage leaf or a leaf, big leafy thing, pour some beer underneath it, leave it in your polytunnel, your greenhouse or your veg bed. And what will happen at night is they'll all be attracted to the beer and then they'll just stay there because it's nice and dark and wet and foosty. Um, and then um, go and collect them in the morning. Go first thing in the morning with a bucket and collect them. That's interesting. Which birds like snails? Birds don't seem to like snails. My chickens, when I let my chickens in the garden, are absolutely carnivorous. Um, and I mean, I don't know. My experience is that birds Gosh. do like snails, but that might just be me. Yeah, <laughs> I think they not. They do. Um, <laughs> Some of your crows and uh, hawks and owls and things will eat um, snails and that as well. Um, but also my ducks eat them. My ducks absolutely love them. They go she's nuts. In, she's in the middle of Inverness, Jill. Oh, right. Looking down the pond. <laughs> Sorry. Collect them up. And take them the other thing is if you do have slugs and snails, they travel a really long distance. Do not just throw them into your neighbour's garden because they might just come back if the grass is greener. So you actually need to transport them off site um, mm. I don't know. Um, if you're getting any sort of, um, oh God, song thrushes and that, any sort of thrushes, well, um, squirrels, mice, um, yeah. Am I still up? Am I still? I yeah, you sort of dipping out. Where have but I you're gone? Here. You're here. Uh, oh, Helen. Don't leave things around for them to congregate on. If you've got big piles of wood or chip or brass, you know, the, look at the habitats of snails and slugs. If you've got a big snail problem, they tend to like heavier, wetter clay soils. Um, so if you've got wooden edge beds and you're getting an awful lot of slugs and snails, are they hiding between the bark? Are they hiding down the edges? Just start to observe like the um, habitat. You know, look, take a holistic view. It means something is out of balance and your predator is in balance. My experience as gardeners, each year there's a different predator that's got the balance. You know, last year it was pigeons for us up at the gardens. And the year before it was cabbage white butterflies. It, it tends to be that there's a, and, and that happens in nature. That's natural. Um, cycles ebb and flow. And so um, over plant, if you've got a lot, they like hiding your rocks. Can you move your rocks? Are your rocks part of your garden? You know, yeah, they've, you've, you've created an ideal habitat for them. Um, I'm really sorry. I do find slugs and snails a really interesting conversation, but I'm mindful of the time. <laughs> I love a good slug and snail. Um, I would um, direct you, Helen, the um, Leg Learning Centre. I've got that Facebook page. Maybe share some pictures on there and look for advice from other people that are on there and because we, you would understand the situation more. I'm good, just going to invite, if there's anyone from Leg Learning Centre that wants to say anything to close... Hello. Yeah, this has been so incredible. Thank you guys for sharing all your knowledge and, and passing it along. I, I jumped in briefly to the chat at the end or at the beginning when I first came in about how great it is that we can 
connect um, because, you know, if we all had to drive to Thurso for a course, it probably wouldn't have worked out. So it's been so fantastic being able to hear from you and, and learn together in a lot of ways. So I'll, I'll share the Facebook page with group again. It's a great resource for everybody to kind of share progress and ask questions. And there might be someone in the group that can answer a question or, or we can try and figure it out. Um, and and like they meant, like was mentioned earlier, we've got a composting workshop coming up on the 6th of March. And then you guys will be doing your, your polycrop um, workshop in, in, in the spring. So those are some other fun gardening programs to look forward to. Thanks, Great. Well, I think, do you have anything you want to say in closing? That's us pretty much. Just um, thank you, everybody, for showing up each week. We've, uh, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've been amazed um, by the numbers. Um, it's been lovely to have you along with us each week and uh, really enjoyed a bit of banter. <laughs> nice speaking to people it's just so nice speaking to people just now when you're um when we're all in sort of isolation at the moment but um but yeah just enjoy your your growing and remember that it's um supposed to be something that you enjoy as well so don't forget to sit back in and and see you know look at how far you've come and what you've done and um, just learn to appreciate what's around you um and i'm i'm really glad to have uh, been part of it so yeah thanks Thanks. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, it's been brilliant. Thanks very much. Ah, thanks. Thanks ever so much for Leg Learning Center for inviting us. I think we've absolutely loved working with you. So thanks, Rebecca and Sarah and Rihanna. Um, and that's us then. So I think we'll just give everyone a, a minute or two and then we're gonna throw you all out. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna stop recording now, but thanks ever so much. And, and, and good luck with your growing. I'd, I'm gonna join that Facebook group just so I can see. What the crack is, so share <laughs> pictures, share pictures of your plants because we're really excited. Cool. Okay, bye. thank you. Bye bye, bye everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Take bye -bye. care. <laughs>